Um, so let me just introduce, uh, welcome to our third um, Gender Equity and Ethics um, McLean 41st Public uh, Lecture Series. Um, we're really excited for this series. As you know, it's um, alternating between virtual and in-person. Um, and I'm excited to introduce Dr. Jagsey um, today. So let me go ahead with the introductions um, for her. Dr. Jagsey um, is the Newman Family Professor and Deputy Chair in the Department of Radiation Oncology and the Director of the Center for Bioethics and Social Sciences and Medicine at the University of Michigan currently. She's the author of over 400 articles in peer reviewed journals, including the New England Journal of Medicine, The Lancet and JAMA, her research has been funded by the U.S. National Institutes of Health, the Susan Komen Foundation, and numerous other foundations. She's both a clinical trialist and a health services researcher. She's internationally recognized for research to strengthen autonomy in breast cancer patients and to individualize breast cancer care. She leads multi-center randomized uh, clinical trials for forgoing radiotherapy in lower risk patients, intensifying in patients with more aggressive disease, and enhancing patient-centered communication. She's a recipient, recipient of multiple RON grants from the NIH and independent grants from foundations, including the Komen Senior Scholars Award. She's authored over 400 publications and delivered scores of keynote addresses and visiting professorships and received many honors, including the Lead Oncology Woman of the Year Award, Astro's Inaugural Mentorship Award, and AMWA's Woman in Science Award. She serves on the steering committee um, of the Early Breast Cancer Trialist Collaborative Group and has served on the program committee for the San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium and the board of directors for ASCO. In November, Dr. Jagsey will become the chair of radiation oncology at Emory University. And we're excited to welcome her back for the second time. She spoke for the Department of Medicine Women's Committee for our last in-person speaker um, in February, 2020. So it's great to have you back, Dr. Jagsey, welcome. Thank you so much. You guys were the last talk I gave before the pandemic. And so it's just a, a, a real treat to feel like I'm coming full circle to, to be back with you um, in this new uh, virtually connected world that we have. So um, I will be speaking about how promoting equity for women in medicine is a matter of professional ethics. And I'll begin by just um, laying out that argument, which um, I will do very briefly given the sophistication of this audience. but. In a nutshell, there are both deontological and teleological arguments uh, that standing up against gender bias and harassment is itself a matter of professional ethics. Um, of course, duty-based arguments, deontological arguments abound in that if we are to respect the categorical imperative, which states that we must out of respect for human beings, fundamental um, dignity that derives from our capacity for freely willed thought, uh, freely willed action and, and uh, rational thought, that in order to demonstrate respect for persons qua persons, we must treat each person as an end in himself. And so in so doing, we must accord respect to persons in a way that creates fair equality of opportunity to positions that are highly sought after. And that includes senior positions in academic medicine. And it certainly means not treating one another in biased and harassing ways, right? Disrespectful ways. Um, those are very powerful arguments as we all know. And yet they may not be the most compelling to everyone. In fact, as I've learned in a long career as a bioethicist who has studied um, these, these issues, and I'm sorry that the bio got muddled because I think my assistant um, well-meaningly updated my bio because I'm moving to, uh, to Emory and gave you my breast cancer bio, but um, I have been studying these issues of gender equity for quite some time. And um, in so doing, um, I have come to receive a number of uh, quite uh, disappointing reviews from people um, who feel that when you use even the word duty or the word fairness, or the word respect, um, that somehow you're criticizing them for intentionally um, acting in an unfair way. And of course, that's not what any of us mean to do, especially when we're advocating for equity or advocating for resources to promote diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I have found that the most um, powerful arguments uh, to bring in uh, the inclusive crowd of people that lead us is um, 
to frame things on the consequentialist, the teleological arguments. And those include the arguments that um, academic medicine has a tripartite mission, um, that we are engaged in education of the next generation, that we are engaged in clinical care and we are engaged in research, and that we are better at delivering on all three aspects of the mission if we have a diverse uh, group of individuals on faculty. And so that includes um, role modeling for the half of the medical school class that is now women. That includes um, diversity in terms of asking uh, the, uh, the most insightful research questions using the most rigorous uh, methods and being more likely to achieve uh, solutions. Of course, we know that collective intelligence is improved uh, by diversity and turn taking and, and sharing our voices. Um, and then finally, uh, there is the clinical mission where um, the teleological arguments are quite profound. And I know that you're hearing from other speakers in this session who will emphasize some of these studies, and so I won't go into them in great detail, uh, but we'll only emphasize that these are not studies that say that everyone must have a healthcare provider who is a perfect demographic match. Rather, what these suggest is that diversity in the delivery system, diversity amongst providers, such that the physician population is more representative of the patient population we serve, uh, is likely to improve our ability to deliver care. And so what I'll do over the next uh, 45 minutes to hour or so is to outline for you um, some information we have uh, gathered, my team and others, about the nature and causes of gender inequity in academic medicine um, and make the argument that I made two years ago when I visited in person, that this is not simply due to a slow pipeline, but rather reflects the differential impact of unconscious biases, gendered expectation of society, um, harassment, and more. And I will use that to frame us on evidence-based interventions that actually we knew about before the outbreak of the pandemic. In fact, the National Academies came out with a, a landmark report on promising practices that was released in February of 2020. And yet, of course, um, it didn't get as much attention as it should have or would have uh, because we all had our attention um, turned elsewhere because of the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, which I would like to then turn to um, as a reframed disruptive opportunity for us. Um, certainly there is evidence that things have gone in the wrong direction, that some of those challenges have actually been um, not only highlighted but amplified during the pandemic, um, but we can also use this time as an inflection point, as a time that we can actually make meaningful progress towards change. Um, so this is a curve showing women's representation in the medical profession. And what you can see here is that women are now um, an increasing share of the medical student body, but that it wasn't always so. And so it wasn't until the enactment of Title IX in 1972 that it actually became illegal for medical schools to discriminate against women in admissions, in hiring, and in promotions. And so with Title IX, we saw a rapid increase in women's participation such that Three decades ago, women broke 40%. Um, and women have been a substantial minority of the medical school class for quite some time um, in that 40 to 50% range. And then more recently, of course, um, have hit that 50% mark. But this is not the case in leadership positions. As you can see in the most recent year for which we have the AAMC benchmarking report, women constituted 18% of department chairs and deans, the senior most positions that are most influential um, in academic medicine. And this extends to other influential positions, including authorship of um, medical uh, journal articles, membership on editorial boards of influential medical journals. And of course, this is really important because we know that the way that we communicate in academic medicine is the discourse that we have with one another um, via publications. And this is how we set the agenda uh, for where where research goes in the future, so it is extraordinarily important. But there is this pipeline hypothesis that says, yes, but if we just wait, if we just wait long enough, things will work themselves out. And Lynn Nonemaker did the best type of study to evaluate this um, back in 2000. Um, she didn't look at just a static cross-sectional slice like the two prior slides that I just showed you, the, um, the leadership positions and the authorship. Um, what she did, and, and the authorship slide I showed you, um, I will point out was from a long time ago. It was the first study that I did in this area, um, but sadly has been replicated time and time again. We still haven't really solved that problem. But what I will say is those static slices in time are nowhere near 
near as gratifying or informative as studies that actually look at cohorts over time. And so Nonamaker did this, and she looked at cohorts who graduated medical school between 1979 and 93, and found the proportion of women who reached the rank of associate professor was significantly lower than expected in all but two of the cohorts. And that was um, even the case when you reached the rank of associate professor, um, women were still less likely to become full professor, and it wasn't a small difference. The difference between observed and expected was five standard deviations off. Uh, so this was a compelling study that suggested that the pipeline had not worked itself out, but you could make the argument, well, you know, 1979 to 93, maybe if they had looked at more recent classes where women were more than 40%, maybe then they would have seen a, a change. And so Kimber Richter and colleagues actually did just that and published in the New England Journal of Medicine their analysis of AMC data. Um, and they found exactly the same thing, that the difference had not actually narrowed over time. But these types of studies relying exclusively on um, AAMC data on the entirety of the academic medical workforce um, are subject to a different form of criticism, which is that we may be combining apples and oranges here. That women and men may enter academic medicine for different reasons, and that women are known uh, thanks to Julia Files and colleagues, uh, their research has shown that women are more likely to be on clinician educator tracks. Um, and so perhaps when we see that women aren't advancing at the same rate as men, it's not that similarly situated, apt and motivated research faculty aren't advancing at the same rate, but rather that women are more likely to be clinician educators and that medical schools place disproportionate value on the scholarly discovery aspect of their mission. And we know that that's likely to be the case. And of course, there would be policy implications um, to that, but they are different policy implications than if we had evidence that research-oriented faculty were also having different outcomes based on their sex or gender. And so this is what led me to a whole line of research that I have pursued over the past couple of decades. Um, we looked at NIH's K award recipients, K08s and K23s, which are awards that are made at the national level to individuals who have clinical doctorates. They're highly competitive awards. To get these awards, you have to have a demonstrated aptitude and motivation to become an independent investigator. And the goal of these awards is to create independent investigators. And so this was the first time that anyone took the publicly available data and instead of looking as NIH had done before at the rates of success of individual applicants um, for an individual award, so saying, hey, did the applications that came in for this grant mechanism do any worse because they were submitted by women? Um, rather to look at individuals who would have been assumed to succeed, individuals who got these incredibly competitive K awards and had the resources that these K awards provide for protected time and dedicated mentorship and training, and see whether they ultimately went on to reach the end point they were supposed to achieve, which was attainment of independent investigator status. And not that R01s are the only kind of independent investigator award, but as we all know, R01s are held out as a benchmark of the transition to success, and they were um, available, and they're the most common independent award given by the NIH. And so we looked at the NIH's CRISP system and applied actuarial analysis because I'm an oncologist and I think of everything in actuarial survival curves. And this was a fortuitous coincidence because it turns out it's a really good way of looking at these data. And what you see there is that the survival curves separate, kind of like I have a great treatment. Um, sadly, I don't have a great treatment. Um, but the difference here is between a crude binary attribution of male versus female based on the first name of the individual and Google searching to, to find them. Um, and this is by no means the best way to do this, but this was an early study, and this is how uh, we were able to discover that even in an apples to apples cohort where everyone would have agreed, even Larry Summers himself uh, would have agreed that there's no difference in the aptitude of these individuals or their commitment to research careers. Um, we were seeing that gender was an independently significant predictor of R01 attainment, and that was true even on a multivariable analysis that controlled for everything that we could control for in the publicly available data. And that includes um, the K award type, KO8s versus 23s, that's uh, laboratory oriented versus patient oriented research, um, the year of the K award, because we know that the 
the funding environment became increasingly challenging and that women were constituting a larger proportion of the more recent classes of K awardees. We controlled for funding institute because we know that women apply to the less well funded institutes. Um, so if we're if we're funding heart, lung and blood and cancer very well and we're funding mental health and children's health very poorly, that might explain things. Um, we control for institution because it turned out that women were less well represented at the institutions that overall had the um, higher amounts of extramural research funding um, and we controlled for specialty and again gender was independently significant. We then went on with the support of a grant from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation to uh, survey K awardees and I was a little nervous about surveying because we thought who's likely to have uh, you know, non-response bias, who's likely not to respond. It's gonna be people who um, maybe weren't successful, weren't still in academia, uh, but we actually had over 70% response rates to all of the survey studies that I'm gonna show you. So K awardees are amazing um, in many ways, including um, being very curious. And when they got a survey questionnaire, this is our most recent one, some of you in the audience may have received it, but they got survey questionnaires that say at the top, um, survey of NIH K award recipients um, funded through an, NI an R1 grant from the NIH, um, they realized that it would actually be really important for them to participate. And so um, what we went on to do was ask about um, their other forms of success? Were they getting other large grants? Were they um, succeeding in other ways? Uh, you know, one hypothesis that was thrown out to me after that prior study was that uh, promising K awardees who were women who had, uh, you know, uh, gotten their K awards were so promising for leadership that they were being immediately plucked and elevated to be division chiefs and department chairs and never had a chance to get their own R01s because they were ending up uh, mentoring the R01 development of an entire department. And how could I argue that that wasn't success? Um, so we asked, and um, it turns out that's not the case, but uh, we looked at leadership positions, we looked at um, other forms of grants, we looked at other ways that individuals could be productive at work, and we also asked about compensation. And what we found was that even after controlling for all of these other uh, forms of productivity and um, differences that might exist in terms of demographic characteristics, we found that the women were paid less than the men. And the original difference was a $32,000 difference. It was about $200,000 for men, $168,000 for women. Uh, that difference was cut in half by adjusting for specialty alone. Now, my hypothesis going into this was that that was going to be the case, that specialty would explain a lot of this. The studies that had come before had often shown that there was a, a gender difference in compensation, but had lacked access to any information about the characteristics, like forget productivity. They often didn't even have access to specialty information. And my hypothesis was that specialty was gonna uh, account for a whole lot of the difference and everything else was gonna account for a whole lot less, which was true, but what ended up placing this in JAMA, I think, was what no one expected, was that there would be such a substantial, unexplained gender difference in compensation after we controlled for all of these uh, factors and more. And that $12,000 difference a year, we um, crudely said over the course of a career, is quite substantial because, of course, there are increases that occur with COLA um, and, uh, you know, adjustments, especially in an inflationary environment, um, that will increase that difference over time. These individuals were about 40 when they answered this survey, so, you know, they had a long career ahead of them for those things to continue to diverge, um, and that that was quite a substantial amount of money. Um, and there was a just recently a really nice um, simulation study that um, included some of your colleagues that, um, uh, that that showed that when you actually accumulate the difference in um, in current dollars and in current differences, um, it's over two million dollars over the course of a career. So what's going on here? Um, one thing, as I've mentioned, is specialty choice. You'll realize that when I put things in quotation marks, I think they're not freely willed choices. Um, but women may be encouraged to occupy lower paid specialties, and specialties chosen by women may pay less part partly because they're predominated by women or because they involve less valued feminine behaviors. What do I mean there? Well, I mentioned earlier, right, that women are more likely to be clinician educators. Women have been socialized from a very young age to demonstrate communal behaviors, caretaking, evaluation and management services, anyone? So women are more represented in those specialties that deliver counseling based interventions and men have been socialized from a very early age to demonstrate agentic behaviors and those include um, scholarly discovery right and 
um, interventions like surgical interventions, like interventions that people consider actual interventions when they pay for interventions and procedures more um, in our in our CPT coding uh, system. And so um, when we determine WRVUs for compensation, um, they have integrated uh, those biases. And so that's very important to keep in mind. It's also important to recognize that there are differences in productivity hours and willingness to change institutions, but that these choices are made within the constraints of a gender structured society, whereby we expect as a society, I don't mean me, um, as a society, we expect women to partner with men. And please hear me, I am not saying that I expect women to partner with men. We expect women to partner with men who are at or above their age and at or above their educational status. That is by far the most common partnership pattern in our society, right? And what does that mean? That means that even if two people are in uh, a, a two physician relationship, and we've published this in, in the Journal of General Internal Medicine, um, the woman's career in the couple comes second. Um, and the woman is a because the man is just a little older um, and maybe a little bit ahead of her. Um, so even when you have the same educational status, that ends up being an issue. Um, and so if the way that we um, in increase salaries is by having someone um, threaten to leave or leave the institution um, for a better job, then that is constrained by the ability to make a credible threat to leave. Um, there are differences in rank and leadership positions, um, and we controlled for this in our model. Um, but it's also important to realize that in so doing, we probably over controlled, right? Because unless the processes for determining advanced rank and leadership positions are themselves entirely unbiased, then it's a double whammy, right? So if it's Bob, the department chair, plays golf with John on Sunday and decides on Monday he needs a new division chief and gosh, John's a good guy and I just heard about all the good work John's doing and makes him the division chief. And then a few weeks later has Jane in his office saying, I realize that John is making more compensation than I am. Um, why is John earning more money than me? And Bob's response is, well, you know, John's the division chief, so he's doing all that work. That's a double whammy for Jane. She doesn't get to have the influence and the authority that a division chief has and to provide that um, that voice, and she gets compensated less. So that's all very important, but also important is that there is that sub substantial unexplained gender difference that did remain after we accounted for all of these factors and more. So what else could be going on? Well, there could be gender differences in values or behavior. Perhaps mothers are sacrificing pay for unobserved job characteristics like flexibility. Fathers are trying to earn more to support their families. Um, those would be concordant with our gender stereotypes. Uh, but in this study, there was a relatively homogeneous job type. Remember, these are K awardees. So they were um, primarily still doing quite a bit of research. Um, there was also, and so they're not the people that are you know, super engaged in clinical care and frequently taking overnight call and long shifts. And we saw no interaction between gender and parental status. Even the women without children in this sample had lower pay than men. But of course, we know that there are other patterns of family caregiving, including elder care, that vary by gender. And so perhaps this was somewhere in there. Um, Anthony Losasso, who's a health economist, actually had that hypothesis. He spoke to the Wall Street Journal, um, I think it was the Wall Street Journal, about this, um, this study and said, yeah, but there's got to be something they didn't measure. And to his credit, he got New York State starting salary data and just published in Health Affairs a couple of years ago, um, a study that actually tried to dig into this question. And what he ended up doing was replicating the study perfectly. Um, specialty accounted for half of the difference um, and, and actually uh, uh, preferences for family flexibility accounted for none of the gender difference in compensation that he observed. What about the possibility that women don't ask? We all know the book by Babcock and Lashiver that details the abundant social scientific evidence that has shown that uh, women do not negotiate in the same way as men, and that is adaptive because if they do, they're penalized for using some of those same strategies. Um, and, you know, I try to make my talks um, uh, about the, the science and understanding and how we can transform systems. Um, but every once in a while, there's someone on the call who says, what can I do to help myself? And I'm not really about adapting to broken systems, but um, one thing we all can do, whether we're leaders or whether we are um, just beginning in our careers, is to make, to make ourselves familiar with the negotiation literature, with um, understanding, um, you know, getting to yes and women don't ask and ask for it and never split the difference. Those are all books that are out there that if we had gone to law school or business school, we would have been required to read. Um, and yet in medical education, uh, we do not um, uh, require and it's to the detriment of all of us, right? Because um, 
many of us, and we we interviewed our K awardees and we found this, that many of us have a naivete about what negotiation is. We think it's like buying a used car. Um, we think that it is positional bargaining where one side wins and the other side loses and there is just a fixed pie and that's it. And that is not the case in real life. Most negotiations um, can benefit from a, a viewpoint that there is a possibility um, for mutual interests and shared gains to actually increase the size of that pie. Um, and so techniques of principle negotiation are really important. It may not all be on the employee side, of course. Um, gender differences in compensation can also reflect differences in employers' behavior, including statistical discrimination, whereby they're making inferences based on group characteristics rather than individual characteristics when they set salaries, and also this really, really persistent notion of the family wage, whereby we assume there is a single male breadwinner at home, um, a, a, sorry, a single male, a male breadwinner with a wife at home who's caring for the family, and so we need to pay the man enough to support that whole family. And when we see a woman asking for a raise, we think to ourselves, well, what's she going to use that for? Um, you know, she's going to go buy a pair of fancy high heels. You know, I mean, I know what he's going to use it for. He's going to use it for, um, you know, his kids' college tuition, and he's going to use it to, to put food on his, his family's table. She's got a husband who works. Who needs to pay her more? And of course, that is really problematic. Um, we also have a real problem with structural sexism, and I know that you've just heard from Amy Gottlieb in this series, so I will simply um, point out that Amy is amazing, and that in the most recent 2021 AAMC report, um, that we saw that in every racial subgroup, women are earning somewhere on the order of 70 something cents per dollar earned by men and that is not acceptable and what it does is reflect the ways that sexism is imbued into all of our structures into all of these constructs that we use to determine what total compensation should be so you know those things that i've talked about um, penalties for negotiation um, i know amy will have talked to you about um, occupational gender segregation and of course what i'm talking about in terms of specialty is just one uh, one form of occupational gender segregation, um, productivity metrics, um, a premium for leadership and rank and seniority all come into play here. There is also a problem of unconscious bias, which is the phenomenon of deeply ingrained notions held by all of us. This is not this is not one group trying to intentionally oppress another group. This is sadly all of us um, holding these deep notions um, that have been demonstrated in a National Academies report um, as an impressive body of controlled experimental studies and examination of decision making processes in real life that show that on the average people are less likely to hire a woman than a man with identical qualifications, less likely to ascribe credit to a woman than a man for identical accomplishments, and when information is scarce far more often give the benefit of the doubt to a man than a woman and so we have seen this the classic demonstration of this is the blinded cv study so uh stein price and colleagues did um, the seminal study um, in this area um, whereby they asked their colleagues in academic psychology um you know, this is a sham CV, would you hire this person on your faculty? And could you just give us some ratings for their teaching, their scholarship and their service? And they sent half the people a CV titled Brian Miller, the other half a CV titled uh, uh, Karen Miller. And it turns out that Brian Miller is not only more likely to be hired than Brian uh, than Karen Miller, but actually gets higher ratings on, uh, you know, the objective metrics of teaching and scholarship and service. And so that false dichotomy that I hear over and over and over again um, in my life, which is, you know, why do you care so much about diversity, equity, and inclusion? Why can't we just focus on excellence? Um, is that we're not very good at objectively determining excellence. This has been shown um, in the lower left, um, the PNAS study um, in academic medicine and in the most disappointing study ever. Um, Emily and Greg are so much more employable than Lakeisha and Jamal that Lakeisha and Jamal need nine more years of experience to get job interviews at the same rate as Emily and Greg. And this brings me to the most important slide in this talk, which is a, a slide on intersectionality, because up until now, I've been speaking about gender as though it's binary and the, as though it's the only thing. And I've been conflating sex and gender, which we know are not the same thing. Um, and that is how, and I've done that deliberately because that is how the research up until more recent um, studies has evolved. And we now recognize, uh, thanks to the, um, the, the, the thought leadership of Kimberly Crenshaw, who, who 
coined the term intersectionality, which refers to the fact that individual human beings are not uh, simply one characteristic, but an amalgamation of many different characteristics, and they inhabit a unique intersection um, of those characteristics, whereby we can only understand their lived experience by considering all of those characteristics um, in, in their totality and not, um, uh, not by looking at one versus the other. So for example, um, the experience of being a Black woman in the United States today is not simply the additive uh, effect of binary racism and binary sexism, right? There's, there's a unique experience um, that exists there that must be understood. And for those who will ask me in the question and answer where things should go forward, I will come back to this because of course, um, the, the work we really have ahead of us really needs to focus on the understudied intersectional issues that exist. Um, and that has been increasingly emphasized over the years by the National Academies of, of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine reports. So I am now very pleased to be on the National Academies um, Committee on Women in Science, Engineering and Medicine, but I was not part of the first two reports. I've already um, quoted to you, or first three reports, um, the, I've already quoted to you from Beyond Bias and Barriers. Um, in the next few slides, I'll show you um, a little bit from the uh, report on sexual harassment of women and from promising practices. And then I'm going to close by reflecting on the report that I, the first report that I've had anything to do with directly, which is the impact of COVID on uh, the careers of women, uh, because it is such an important disruptive opportunity. So before turning the sexual harassment report, I just want to reflect on um, a couple of other drivers of these differences. Um, we are not on a level playing field. Seemingly gender neutral norms, practices, and policies do have a negative impact that is disparate upon women. And the other last talk I gave before the pandemic broke out was also in Chicago, and it was also um, in February of 2020. And it was to, um, it was at ACGME headquarters, it was to leaders within the ABMS and the ACGME to talk about policies that govern leave from medical training. Because even though our own American Academy of Pediatrics has come out in support of policies at, that would permit 12 weeks of paid parental leave for everyone, we for many years in our profession seemed to carve out an exemption for our future colleagues. And so many residents have been unable uh, to take civilized amounts of leave. And those policies do have a disproportionate impact on those who bear children and lactate. There are expectations regarding work hours, um, really early morning meetings, really late evening meetings, tenure clocks, limits on grant eligibility, all of which conspire to have a disproportionate effect on those who in our society are disproportionately likely to take on family and caregiving tasks. So this is a forced collision of biological and professional clocks that magnifies the inequities of the traditional gender division of labor. And this is like my favorite study ever. And I'm pretty sure I showed it the last time I spoke at the University of Chicago, but I do think you guys are a slightly different audience and I just have to show this again because this is a study where we actually asked our participants, these were K awardees, these were K awardees from 2006 to 2009. So this is the most meta study I've ever done. These are people who are roughly my vintage. Um, so they're generation Xers in case you're wondering what my vintage is. At the time they answered these surveys, they were in their early 40s. Um, this was my very first R01 grant, and it was an R01 grant on R01 attainment. It was understanding why people um, did go on to get R01s. And um, in this incredibly meta, in so many ways, study, we asked um, about how people were spending their time. And we asked in the way that labor economists think about time. There is paid labor and there's unpaid labor. And no surprise to anyone, the women were not doing less labor than the men. Um, However, if you looked at paid labor, the hours were lower for women. And what was squeezing out the paid labor, which is those first one, two, three, four bars, right out to the number six, um, was the unpaid labor, the domestic labor, the parenting and domestic tasks. And so you can see there the unadjusted difference between married and partnered women with children and married and partnered men with children, which were the two largest groups. And even after we adjusted for many other factors, because you guys have heard me say earlier on that we live in a gender structured society. So you know what? Spousal employment status is different. In fact, over half of the men in the sample have part-time or non-working spouses. 90% of the women in this sample have full-time employed spouses. So that's just how it plays out when I talk about, um, you know, prioritizing careers and families, right? Even after you adjust for that and many other factors, the women are spending eight and a half more hours per week on parenting and domestic tasks. These are K awardees. Can you imagine how many more papers and grants could have been written in that eight and a half hours per week? 
And in the subgroup with spouses or domestic partners who were employed full time, we said, what do you do when your usual childcare arrangements are disrupted? And believe me, this was 2014 when we fielded these surveys. I was not anticipating the pandemic. I did not envision Ann Arbor Public Schools shutting down in March of 2020 and not having a single day of in-person instruction until May of 2021, which is actually what happened here. But I was envisioning, you know, snow days or the kid being too sick to go to daycare or the nanny being too sick to come in, something like that. And so we asked, what do you do when your usual child care arrangements are disrupted? And 43% of these incredibly high achieving K awardee women dealt with it themselves as opposed to 12% of the men. The choices were, I deal with it myself, my sponsor partner deals with it, we split it pretty evenly, we have someone else we turn to. So that has real consequences. So we, because it was an R01 grant, we were actually able to survey these individuals in a longitudinal fashion and look at what factors at time one predicted for outcomes at time two. And so one thing that we found at time two um, in these individuals who we started surveying during their K awards was that four years later, the women were more likely with a binary cutoff um, for, for burnout using the Copenhagen burnout inventory, um, the women were more likely to be burned out than the men. And if we use it as a linear scale, the women were more burned out than men. Um, and that's not news. That's, you know, every study of burnout shows this. And also shockingly high proportions of, of men and women were burned out. And again, not news. Physicians are really burned out. It's, you know, certainly the case now post COVID, right? But what prior studies hadn't been able to do was to unpick why the gender difference exists. And so what we were able to, to see with that longitudinal design was that the difference between men and women was explained by those time pressures that I just showed you for parenting domestic tasks and by perceptions of work climate. So why might women perceive the work climate to be negative? And this takes me to the iceberg of sexual harassment, which was um, a, a metaphor that was initially developed by Lilia Cortina, who's actually a women's studies professor and colleague of mine here at the University of Michigan. Um, and it's very important in several ways. And one is that, of course, the tip of the iceberg is what people focus on, and it is much smaller than the very large base, which is the foundation upon which it grows, right? And so the tip of the iceberg is those coercive advances, the quid pro quo, the Harvey Wein Einstein type of um, uh, experiences that people think of when the word sexual harassment is used. And yet far more common in the three decades of organizational psychology research that has been done on sexual harassment in organizations is gender harassment, um, crude remarks, um, sexist remarks, uh, crude behaviors, all of those things that are underneath the surface that actually have been shown in that three decades worth of work to have equally detrimental impact on the outcomes we care about, professional well-being, mental well-being, physical well-being of our colleagues. And when we did this study um, back in 2014, when we surveyed our K awardees, we actually asked them about um, their sexual harassment experiences using the same item that had been used back in a 1995 survey, which was the last time anyone had really done a good study of academic medical faculty in the United States. It was a 1995 cross-sectional survey that asked, in your professional career, have you encountered unwanted sexual comments, attention, or advances by a superior or colleague? And so back then, um, and this was Phyllis Carr and colleagues with the support the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, they found that 52% of the women had experienced that. But it was a cross-sectional cohort. So they had women who had gone to medical school in the 1970s, where I showed you women were only a small minority of the medical school class and certainly were not well represented on faculty. And so perhaps their experiences had occurred during that time of transition. And so if we asked this modern Generation X cohort who grew up like me expecting an egalitarian division of domestic labor, which didn't pan out, but expecting to be treated respectfully in the workforce, surely at least the latter would pan out. This really was, um, it may sound incredibly naive now, but it didn't seem naive back then. People thought this was gonna be my good news study. Um, glass half full, I mean, it was 30% instead of 52%. Um, but it was 30%, right? And this was shocking. And look at the date of publication. This is before the real awareness of the Me Too movement. This was before the 2016 presidential election when this um, was published. And this got a lot of attention as a result, right? And what we found was that the experience of harassment did have consequences. Uh, nearly 60% perceived a negative effect on confidence in themselves as professionals, and nearly half of those who were harassed reported that the experiences negatively affected their career advancement. And so what we have to 
to do is learn from the evidence and intervene. We need to gather data and you could say, well, but didn't you just show us some data? Yes, I showed you some data, but that was with a single item question, which is by far from, it's, it's not the best way to measure sexual harassment. What you really need to do is detail all the behaviors that constitute the iceberg and say, has this happened? Has that happened? Has the other thing happened? Um, you, you are much more uh, likely to actually pick up on harassment. And so the, the gold standard is the SEQ. And when you administer the SEQ, as we have done here at the University of Michigan, as we've done um, in the, the specialty of oncology and others have done in other settings, you find that the majority of men and women alike, but the vast majority of women and the majority of men have experienced um, sexual harassment. Um, we need to um, gather more information about women in those multiple intersecting marginalized groups. We need this information both to inform our interventions and to demonstrate the commitment of the organizations that are gathering the data. Because we know that the predictor of the, in, in meta-analyses of sexual harassment in organizations, um, the most important predictor um, is that uh, uh, the perception uh, of the employees that the institution, the organization tolerates harassment. And then we also know that the lowest rates of or sexual harassment occur in organizations that proactively develop, disseminate, and enforce sexual harassment policy. And that includes facilitation of reporting and offering choices in terms of complaint handlers who are diverse in every way, anonymous and, and, um, and confidential reporting systems. All of those things are important, but we've just published in Academic Medicine um, a, a report that really demonstrates quite compellingly that even when one has experienced harassment, um, one is extraordinarily unlikely to report that experience. It is, um, it, it is out of a fear of retaliation, about a fear of being stigmatized or marginalized as becoming the person who was harassed as opposed to the scholar that one spent one's entire career um, seeking to be. Um, and we also need to address harassment by patients and families because we do inhabit a really unique setting um, within which uh, that is a, a phenomenon and, and it is not outside our control by any means. Our, our own ethics center here um, played a big role in developing the patient rights and responsibilities uh, uh, policy here at the University of Michigan, and there are other exemplars um, that have done the same elsewhere. Ultimately, the causal mechanisms at play that lead to women's underrepresentation in senior positions of influence and authority um, are bidirectional. So unconscious bias, sexual harassment, and the gender division of domestic labor all lead to gender inequity in senior and influential positions, but the lack of diversity in those senior and influential positions is exactly the environment within which those other behaviors thrive. And so what we really need to do is move beyond the iceberg to thinking about what's in the water and allowing that iceberg to form in the first place. And if every person on this call could look at those factors in the water, which we've discussed over the course of this talk and think, what's the, I'm sorry, this is the problem of, of hybrid things. I can't make that stop, but just ignore it. Um, it's probably CVS Pharmacy um, calling to remind me of a prescription. Um, so those factors in the water, I'll give you just a second to look at them. Pick one and come up with an evidence-based intervention that you can implement to allow that cause to be solved because this is incredibly complicated but this is also what um what diagrams of carcinogenesis look like right and each investigator in oncology chooses one driver one molecule that they spend their whole career um fixing and they realize that yes there will be escape and there will be um interventions that will um that will eventually develop resistance but they count on their colleagues to be targeting another factor. And if we can just attack this in that way, I think we can be very successful and ultimately change the structures that support harassment by employing more women, promoting more women, and integrating more women into every level of the organization. So we end up with well-integrated, structurally egalitarian workplaces in which everyone equally shares in power and authority. If we don't inflect this curve, this is going to be the case that women will not reach parity amongst the deans until our current class of medical students who are 50% female have retired. We have to inflect this curve. And so there are some promising practices that, as I pointed out, were identified even before the pandemic. And they include mentorship and sponsorship programs at the institutional level. I'm not saying fix yourself and find a mentor. Um, I am saying we as leaders within organizations need to create intentional mentorship and sponsorship programs so that everyone is equally um, able to avail themselves of these opportunities. We need evidence-based implicit bias training. No, not all implicit bias training works, but Molly Carnes has certainly developed some interventions that do appear to work 
um, well in academic medicine. Um, cultural transformation initiatives are incredibly important, and you guys are among the leaders in those types of initiatives. And transparent and consistent criterion-based evaluation, promotion, and compensation processes are absolutely essential. We need to promote work-life integration, and as we've learned in the pandemic, as I'll share in a moment, work-life boundary setting. And these include creative interventions like policies that uh, support individuals who are um, uh, are bearing substantial family caregiving uh, demands, supporting the use of um, uh, funds that are already permissible um, to use to support uh, dependent care expenses, but that many academic institutions have not uh, previously had policies in place to permit um, be used in that way. Time banking initiatives from Stanford has a, a really neat pilot that they used where um, the invisible service that women provide um, more than men and, and other members of marginalized groups as well um, are, are often called upon to be on many thankless committees. Um, those things are then redeemed for points that can be actually used for anything that individual needs, whether it's um, grant writing support at work or food delivery service at home. Really creative initiatives. We inhabit a really exciting time now. Social media brought us together even before the pandemic and perhaps even more so now. Um, I am at Reshma Jagsi. If you want to follow me, I do tweet on these things nowhere near as well as your leaders, though. So um, I mostly just retweet what they say. Um, and then I want to conclude by talking a little bit about the impact of COVID-19. So again, the last time I was there, COVID-19 um, had not developed. We didn't have a name for it, um, but the impact was profound. I think we all know the negative effects that it has had on our productivity, boundary setting and boundary control, networking, community building, and mental well-being. And we know that the women um, who answered this survey that was um, uh, part of this National Academy's report um, did report increased workload, decreased productivity, greater difficulty interacting with colleagues and students, and challenges of remote teaching, remote clinical practice, a negative impact on research, and less time to work. We saw a real impact on authorship. This was a very early study where um, I had actually, I'd written my perspective piece um, in March of 2020, knowing that this was likely to occur, and there was no evidence showing that it was actually occurring. Um, I could see all around me that there was a disproportionate impact on my female colleagues. Um, and some editors wrote back to me and said, yeah, but there's not actually any data. And if anything, the data show that COVID-19 is going to have more impact on, on men in terms of mortality. So I don't think we can write something about the, the perils for women just yet. So I thought, well, where can we get early data? And so we looked at papers that were published about COVID-19, assuming that they had been written at least partly um, and developed at least partly since we knew about COVID-19 and were disrupted by COVID-19 and compared um, authorship patterns uh, to papers published in those same journals the year before. And we've gone on um, to do a, a more mature uh, study that just came out in eLife that um, shows that unfortunately there has been a real and sustained um, impact the survey led by the National Academies showed that there were some boundary management tactics that women were already starting to use during these disruptions, including spatial boundaries, having a separate space that they could go to, even if it was a closet that was held together with a bobby pin. There's actually a compelling study, a story in the in the report about how uh, one woman's toddler had figured out a way to get into the closet. So even when she was like trying with the the Zoom backdrop to 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 get her space, um, she couldn't maintain that spatial boundary, temporal boundaries, technological logical boundaries, and yet um, these boundary management tactics were likely to be insufficient. Um, anxiety levels were extraordinarily high in a study that we led out of the physician moms group. Um, uh, we actually found that 41% um, were scoring off the cutoff for moderate or severe anxiety in April of 2020. Um, and we really found that there were also some silver linings. There were some disruptive opportunities to learn, things that we thought were absolutely impossible before the pandemic were accomplished overnight during the pandemic, right? And one of those things includes um, the transition to uh, virtual pat platforms for conferences. And I really want to um, give a shout out to your organizers for making these hybrid conferences. And I know that you've had some in-person speakers and I'm a virtual speaker, and then you're gonna have some more in-person speakers, and then you're gonna have some more virtual speakers. And really, I think that opens up the ability for people who have other responsibilities um, to participate and to, to be included in these ways. I just can't emphasize that enough. Um, but there are always unintended consequences, right? So with hybrid meetings, um, 
it does become possible to be at a professional society meeting pretty much 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Um, and so there can be over flexibility. Um, there are opportunities for bias to play out in new and different ways. Um, I am not monitoring the chat, but I, I, and so I hope to God this isn't happening in the chat. I only see four things in the chat. So hopefully there's not anyone saying, wow, she's talking too fast. I can't understand her. Let's all go away. Um, you know, wow, I've heard all this before. But I have seen that. Um, and I think some of you may have seen that as well um, in meetings where people just start having their own discussion in the chat while someone is has been asked to deliver a, a lecture, which is really um, quite disrespectful. Um, there are also some ways that we can learn about how to improve our grant making processes. So the Canadians, when they launched their first rapid response COVID-19 funding competition, found that fewer female scientists were applying for, for funding. And so in real time, actually implemented a series of data driven policy interventions before their second call for proposals in April, May of 2020, and they increased the application intake window, allowed submission of abridged biosketches, required reviewers to evaluate the integration of sex, gender, and other identity factors at all stages of the research process. They offered compensation for dependent caregiver costs, extended early career status, doubled parental leave status, and uh, credits, and they allowed an optional COVID impact statement um, to be submitted. And what happened was the proportion of applications that were submitted by individuals who self-identified as female increased substantially, as did the proportion of successful applications with the female PI. There were also um, some creative extensions of existing programs. The Doris Duke Foundation has had a fund to retain clinical scientists that focuses on individuals who have uh, family caregiving demands, and they partnered with a number of other funders to create a one-time collaborative funding opportunity to build on that program and to support individuals who had increased um, caregiving demands during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, we have many ways of accounting for the hidden labor that exists. And so your own colleague, Dr. Aurora, has led a really uh, important study together with your colleagues there um, and uh, showing how we can actually um, operationalize this by a supplement to the CV that captures things that existed even before the COVID-19 pandemic, right? All those forms of invisible service. And in, in emphasizing the service related to the COVID-19 pandemic, it actually highlights the invisible service that existed and was disproportionately borne by certain groups even before the pandemic. And so I see COVID-19 as our disruptive opportunity. It's our chance to inflect that curve. So, you know, as I said, if we keep going on that path, the current class of medical students is gonna have retired by the time we reach parity in the senior positions, and that's not okay. And I get that it, actually looks like the curve is bending in the wrong direction right now, but I'd like to think of it as a point of instability in that curve and it's wiggling and we're going to inflect it in the right direction together. So we really do inhabit a momentous time in history. The pandemic has both highlighted and amplified challenges, but provided a disruptive opportunity to move from awareness to action and really given us an opportunity to apply the very familiar healthcare quality improvement framework whereby we plan to study act to improve structures, processes, and outcomes for the benefit of all. I would like to acknowledge uh, some of my many, many, many collaborators who don't all fit on one screen. My family, who all of us have aged considerably since this photo, um, as I think we all have, um, and all of you for your attention and for allowing me to participate virtually. Um, so I will stop the share with that and turn it over to questions. Thank you, Dr. Jagsi. Um, we have a couple questions in the chat, which I'll read in a second. I just want to, you mentioned the um, transparent promotion processes and I chair the Department of Medicine Women's Committee. I get a lot of questions about that. I think we have our um, Dean for um, Academic Affairs also um, in, and I was just wondering if you can comment on any views about how to make that process more transparent for um, faculty. Yeah, so I think that um, having recorded lectures and written documents on your website, um, again, because not everyone can attend the one meeting that someone delivers um, that explains and demystifies the promotions process, right? But having that available online and in written documentary form so that people can see and, and showing people medians for what does it take to be promoted to this rank on this track and what does it mean and what is valued um, is very important because I think women are very unlikely to promote themselves. Women are um, very unlikely to call attention to their accomplishments. And so if a busy department chair is thinking of who has come to their attention um, as having written a great paper or gotten a new grant, it may be that we've taught 
little boys a little bit more about how to gracefully promote themselves. Um, and we also excuse it more from little boys than little girls. Um, and so uh, it is important for us to inform people of what other people who've been promoted to that rank brought to the table when they went up for promotion. And then it's really incumbent upon us in leadership positions. And this is the hardest thing, not to bend or break those rules and those expectations. And, and I have heard this, um, and it's been such a disappointment to me. Um, I have heard this from so many leaders. Well, but I know, I know a superstar when I see it. And, and I just don't want to lose a superstar. And yes, these rules will apply to 99% of people. But you know, if a guy has these characteristics, it's just we've never seen anything like that before. And the problem is you have seen it before. We, we've had women who've done it before, but they never thought about coming to you and saying, hey, can you actually bend the rules for me? So we have to stick to the criteria. Yeah, that's super helpful. And to your point about recording, like, you know, how to get promoted and videos and things, somebody said, will this recording be sent out? Yes. And the recordings are always placed on the McLean YouTube channel. Um, so that's how you'll access them in the future. Um, I'm going to read, um, it's a, a little bit of a long question. I'm going to paraphrase it. Um, they said, there's a disconnect between the literature that demonstrates the disparity between men and women's salaries and how academic medical centers actually deal with those disparities when it's brought to their attention. The typical response um, is to report the salary disparity um, as an opaque HR investigation where the findings invariably are that there is no disparity and certain factors contribute to the difference of the observed salary. Um, this leads to the faculty member reporting the disparity, feeling really gaslighted. For those of us experiencing this, how do we deal with it? Um, is the only solution to leave the broken system? Is there any way to fix the HR system which reinforces these biases? While I appreciate the call to employ, promote, and integrate more women, as long as the systems are broken, women are going to be harmed um, from entering them in the first place. Mm -hmm. I hopefully couldn't. You, hopefully, either. you got that or read that yourself. I think you can. No, I didn't. I didn't read it myself, but I, I, I heard yeah. it. Yeah, it's 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 a really good point. And so, let me begin by unlighting the gaslighting flame, um, which is yes, you're absolutely right. Um, you can have two people, and and I often think of two chair candidates. Now that I'm going to be a department chair, I've been thinking a lot about chair candidates, but. Um, we can even specify criteria. We can say the criteria to be chair and to get paid like a chair is that you're going to be outstanding in clinical program building, you know, an internationally recognized scholar um, with substantial experience leading um, funded laboratory work, and um, you are a, a dedicated teacher and mentor, right? First of all, um, women are less likely to apply for those jobs because they're like, well, like internationally recognizable. I mean, I know people know me in the US and like a few people know me in like England and Canada, but like, I don't know if anyone in China knows me. And like, I don't, you know, like the, we, we talk ourselves out of like, well, maybe I just need a few more years. When the woman applies, the committee then gets, let's, let's just have candidate A and candidate B and I won't give them genders. There's candidate A who ends up being like, really extraordinary in terms of clinical program building, like has actually established a new multidisciplinary clinic that has transformed care for a certain type of cancer in the region, um, is, is always turned to for clinical care, um, is extraordinary in that, and is definitely a strong researcher, has funded grants, um, you know, not a ton of funded grants, only like you know, maybe one R01 in their history, but like definitely did that stuff, could do that stuff, but was focused on the clinical program building. And then you've got candidate B, who has been a valued member of the clinical team, who certainly is your go-to person if you've got a tough clinical case, is really good in the clinic, um, attends every multidisciplinary clinic, but like didn't build their own multidisciplinary clinic because they're on the international stage always. They've got four active R01s and they're seeing patients and like they're probably the residency program director. And, um, you know, they're, they're doing all of these things. And now you've got to evaluate which one you hire as chair. And what people do is they end up altering the prioritization of those criteria for chair based on the gender of the individual what we were really looking for was the clinical program or no what we were really looking for was this and it's exactly what you're talking about in the salary setting too so let's say you happen to have both those people on your faculty 
um, and you're the chair and you're actually setting their, their salaries. You're like, well, the clinical program builder, if he gets stolen away, I, I you know, our, our revenues will drop. That's really where her money comes in, you know? So I'm sorry, we've really got to focus on the clinical and I'm sorry, I know you're on every international stage and I know you've published in this journal and that journal and you have four R1s and they bring in money, but you know, honey, they, they only bring in the NIH cap and, you know, we as a department really rely on him. So I'm paying him more because he's more important. Um, flip the genders. Well, you know, anyone can build clinical programs and do that kind of thing. You know, if you certainly, you know, sort of rolled up your sleeves and we really appreciate you're keeping the trains running on time. And, you know, we know that you're essential to our clinical service, but ultimately you're replaceable, honey. You know, you, you've done the good clinical work, but what's really important in academic medicine is, is getting grants and being internationally recognized. And that's really rare. And so, honey, I pay him more because, you know, he's really unique. It's, it, it is absolutely the case. And so how do we fix that? First of all, I have not yet found a system where that doesn't exist. Um, so leaving, um, in some cases, may be right. I'm in the process of a career transition myself, but leaving, leaving may be right, but it really should be to go to an opportunity that you think is different and better, not simply because you assume that the equity will be better, because I think I've spoken at almost every medical school at this point, and I haven't found any place that's perfect. There are some that are further along than others, um, but I think that the big issue there is that they can't be one-off equity reviews of the individual um, person, but rather the dean sitting down with the chairs and saying, you're required to have a transparent, consistent system that everybody knows about, and this is how you're compensated. So if it is that we reward the clinical program builders, and that's what's important to us in our department, and we don't care how many R1s you have, then at least you can adapt your behavior, knowing that if you start spending your time on this, you will get compensated. Um, it is the transparency and the the consistency that I think is absolutely key. Sorry for the long answer. Thank you, Dr. Jagsey. It's wonderful to have you and see you again. And uh, especially at this transition for you, uh, you know, as you're about to embark on being a chair. Um, my question is actually a question that I received when I opened this lecture series that I'm going to toss over to you um, because I think it's a question that I know many of us, you know, hear about. And it's actually salient to the comment you just made about visiting all these academic medical centers and all of us are on the journey, but we're not there yet. And as you think about places that are there or closer, can you comment on, you know, I've seen structures, you know, like, I, like for example, in well-being, you know, a lot of people are appointing an officer to do well-being. There are sometimes um, specific leaders that have this title. And so I'm wondering if anyone's ever looked at, you know, institutional structures so that the that the meeting that you described between the dean and the chairs is actually not, you know, maybe it occurs organically, but maybe there's somebody whose like job it is to make sure it occurs. And so I'm curious if you can reflect on that a little bit, as I know um, as through our fund to retain clinical scientists, which we're part fortunate to have, we're having those same same discussions here. Yeah, I, I think it's incredibly important, but um, I think that many, I mean, you know, it's certainly if the organization doesn't have a, a wellness officer or a diversity, equity, and inclusion officer in their senior executive leadership, they're starting to become outliers, right? Most institutions have figured out over the course of the pandemic, at least, that, um, that those individuals need to be appointed. Um, but what's really important is that they're not just appointed, but that they are in the room where it happens, that they are part of the true executive leadership team. And so we see differences. The AAMC is about to come out with a report on the, the deans, uh, the dean suite, both um, who is in those positions and how they're compensated. Um, and I think it would behoove us to look at what we call those roles. Do we call them senior associate dean? Do we call them executive vice dean? Or do we call those simply associate dean? And those are people who are lower down in the hierarchy and ultimately their voices aren't heard. And so this, I think the institutions that are doing better are the ones who exactly as you described, have them in the room where the meeting happens between the dean and the chairs. Because at most academic medical centers, the chairs are the ones who have an incredible incredible amount of the authority. And so if there's a deandom that meets sort of separately and the deans all talk to each other and it's lovely and, you know, they have great ideas, but they never actually interact with the chairs who are the real executives um, in the organization, that's a problem to have that disconnect. 
No, that makes good sense. You know, I also have one more question and we also welcome your questions either, um, I think through the Q and A function. Um, and so I know that, you know, Dr. Jack sees a wealth of information. I'm also wondering, you know, I know we've talked a lot about system solutions, but you mentioned something about, you know, I, I, I mean, actually as a mom to some young kids, you know, I think about this with my daughter and you mentioned, are we doing something differently for boys, you know, and where they feel more confident, you know, and um, are able to ask for what they need. And so my uh, question to you is actually in reflecting on your transition to being a chair and um, and in moving, um, you know, what are some of the ways that you think in, in all the guidance and counseling you've given to women that that we need to be, what do we need to be telling women um, and, and others who may be coming from, you know, um, you know, intersectional identities to make sure that they're able to advocate for themselves? Yeah. So I have taken just about every leadership development course you can, and I think they're wonderful. And I think the ones that are intentional. So AAMC has the early career women in medicine and the mid-career midwims um, uh, sessions. Um, ELAM does it for more senior women. Um, my own professional society, ASCO, does it for, um, it's a leadership development program for men and women and all genders alike um, that are um, mid-career. Uh, and all of these programs are really thoughtful and intentional about not fixing the individuals, but empowering them and positioning them and making them visible to the senior leadership in ways that will then seed the system's leadership with people who have received a certain kind of training. So I think it's a really clever thing, right? So Elam actually was in its 25th year. I was a part of its 25th anniversary class. And the founder of Elam, Paige Morahan, actually said to me, she didn't actually think Elam was going to last anywhere near this long, right? Because it started in 1995. That's the year I matriculated to medical school. So I started medical school when she started ELAM. And it, the idea was in 1995 that the women who had gone to medical school in the 1970s, right after Title IX had been enacted, were finally reaching the level of seniority that they could become senior leaders. And hey, there wasn't anyone like them before so we needed to create a program for them. And then after a little while, they would be there and the problem would have worked itself out. And actually, you know, ELAM has gotten larger and larger and larger. It's oversubscribed. Um, we're running a, a randomized trial right now. And I, I, you know, think some of you may be participants in the randomized trial. I don't look at my participant list, don't worry. But um, I, I do see sometimes like the, the names that are going out right now for invitations for meetings and stuff. So um, we're running a randomized trial of an ELAM-like virtual intervention. Um, and there's such demand for this because if we can have a scalable approach to this, there's so many people who want to be in ELAM who can't. And so the things that they teach, and so what, what are we doing in our curriculum? We're looking at, you know, there's a whole quarter on negotiation. There's a whole quarter on strategic career development that includes graceful self-promotion, developing your elevator uh, pitch, um, you know, sort of recognizing what your strengths are, creating something called a star statement. All of these kinds of things that um, can, can help us um, to advance our own careers, not with the end of fixing ourselves and fitting a broken system, but actually positioning ourselves in a place where we can actually create sustained change. I love the idea for an internal ELAM. Rosie um, wanted to raise her hand and ask a question in person. Yes, yes. I really, really enjoyed the talk. I have a million questions, but to, to <laughs> I just ask one, don't worry. Um, uh, I know I have a lot of personal problem being a woman. For example, I got R1. I have several R other grant and papers. And being 11 years, I haven't had any promotion. The reason is I don't want to uh, compromise. For example, move to different uh, institute or go to different city because to be mom, I have to stay here. So that's I have to compromise. The second thing is I actually serve a lot of leadership. For example, organizing different um, meetings, including H A uh, B C V S meetings. Do spend a lot of time, but. Uh, do you think I I don't know what is a good way to share with our leader or boss to let them know actually I do a lot of activity because I worried people think oh you spend a lot of other time so whether you can focus your study your, your research or not so that's the question I want you those things how can I or how should I share with the leadership the people who <laughs> in charge of my promotion or other things thank you. Yeah, so this is where I think allyship can be really helpful because it is really difficult to promote oneself without 
Um, it, it just is what it is. We, we do not like women who promote themselves. Um, and uh, I, I actually, I, I, I will tell you this. Can we cut off the Q&A here um, for the recording? Can we like just cut it off so that this doesn't end up being recorded? Because I'm happy to share it with a small group, but I don't want it in perpetuity. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, but I know, no, I'm just saying. Yeah, yeah, I'm a beta. Can you turn off the recording?